thank you that you died on the cross for us and was raised with resurrection power. And we pray that you would help us to understand that more fully in our lives, not just so that it's head learning, but it really makes a difference in the way we live, in the way we think, in the way we act. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> I may have mentioned in a previous time, I can't remember, but uh, it was many years ago, I remember going to an Easter service, and uh, the pastors in the, at the beginning of his service said, well, basically, it doesn't really matter whether you could find Jesus' body. Easter really is about joy and, and, uh, and feeling, you know, this hopeful, hopeful feeling, and I don't remember anything else about the sermon. I took a great exception to that, that statement. And uh, sadly, there are, many, there are many people, modern Christians, many modern clergy, who actually don't believe in the resurrection, that it actually was a bodily resurrection. They may talk about it as a, a spiritual resurrection. John Dominic Crossan, who is a New Testament scholar, said maybe dogs ate Jesus' body, but that's not really important. It's just that you know he, his spirit kind of raised, and it was hopeful, and it means that his teachings were were correct and on. And I would say to you, if I didn't believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus, not only would I not be a pastor, I wouldn't bother being a Christian because none of it makes sense. Because if Jesus bodily didn't, didn't raise bodily from the dead, he would be a failed Messiah. We would know nothing about him. There were many, 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 many people crucified in the Roman times. The only person whose name we know about is Jesus. And so for me, the faith in some ways lives or falls on whether Jesus was bodily raised from the dead. And if really the resurrection is kind of a metaphor for springtime, you know, it's spring and all the flowers are blooming. So really, the resurrection is kind of a metaphor that life dies and then it comes to... That, that's a, a very common uh, understanding of the resurrection as well. In fact, I remember uh, before I started pastoring here, I was t teaching at, a, at Dean College. I was team teaching with an English professor. And I can't remember... I don't remember the, the... I don't remember exactly the book that we were reading or what we were studying. But I, again, it was... Uh, the resurrection came up and he totally was telling the students, well, it's really, you know, it's springtime, it's, just the, it's the myth of kind of the dying and the rising, and of course there are in mythology, in Greek mythology, other mythologies, there is the dying and the rising God. And he said, it's just really kind of like that. And, um, you know, I tried to give my viewpoint on that, and he really, he, he just really couldn't see it. But as followers of Jesus, I think it's very, very important that we know what we believe and that we understand the centrality of the resurrection because if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, uh, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, first, first, uh, first Corinthians 15, we are of all people most miserable because then that really wasn't true. And so I'd like to spend a little time this morning reflecting on the resurrection, what we celebrated yesterday. Now, one of the things, in all the Gospels, if you notice it, it's very physical. In our, in our uh, text this morning, in the, which comes from John 20, and if you were here uh, last week for Easter, uh, the text was John 21, 20, verses 1 through 18. And the subject was Mary Magdalene. She goes to the, if you remember, she goes to the tomb, and um, she thinks that the tomb is empty, and so she thinks Jesus is the gardener, and he says, so if you know where you've, where you've laid the body, please tell me. And then at that point he says, Mary, and she recognizes Jesus. And then, um, you know, Peter and uh, John hurry to the tomb to, to see what, what has happened as well. And so then we pick up in today's gospel lesson in verse 19, and so the disciples were gathered in a, in a room, doors were locked, and all of a sudden, Jesus appears. 
And he says, peace be with you. And then he showed them his hands and his side. Now, you can imagine that when this happened, the disciples had to be frightened out of their minds, like this is not something that just happens. And so, again, the, Jesus shows them his hands and his side because he wants to make the point, I'm not a ghost. I mean, I am a real physical being. This is my real physical body. And as John re narrates the story, we know that Thomas... Uh, was not with them at that account, at that appearing. And so the disciples are kind of their minds blown when they see Thomas. And, hey, we saw the Lord, believe it or not. And Thomas, uh, being a good empiricist, says, unless I touch, my, you know, put my hands on the, in the wounds on his hands and put my hand and feel the wound in his side, I will not believe that. And so... Uh, as we know, as the story goes on, there's another time when they're gathered. Again, Jesus appears, and Jesus particularly addresses Thomas. He says, take your hands, touch the wounds on my hands, touch the, touch the wound on my side, and believe. Again, it's, it's very physical. He's not just kind of saying, don't, you know, just me. He's not hovering in the air. There's this kind of very practicality and the, the physicality of the resurrection that he's trying to make the uh, disciples understand that yes it is Jesus this is not some specter or some somebody else it's Jesus who is resurrected and if we think and then the following chapter in chapter 21 Jesus is uh, on the beach the disciples are fishing they don't really recognize him, but when they come in, uh, they recognize him, and he has breakfast with them. Very mundane, very practical things. And the other, all the other gospel accounts, uh, Jesus, they have accounts and encounters with the physical Jesus, except for the book of Mark, which has got the last chapter of uh, verse, uh, the last part of chapter 16 has been lost. But even there, the message for the disciples is that they're going to, Jesus is going to go ahead to Galilee and meet them there. You think in the Gospel of Luke, the two disciples that were on the road to Emmaus, and Jesus joins them, and uh, again, like Mary, they don't recognize him, and then he has, he has a meal with them, and it's only when he breaks the bread that they recognize it's Jesus. And in Matthew, again, the encounters are very physical. He encounters people. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul tells us that Jesus appeared to over 500 people, many of which were still alive when Paul was writing the letter. But there was something different about Jesus as well. And when you look at the different, when you look at the different stories, uh, there are inconsistencies here. And so atheists or agnostics will say, see, I mean, this is so inconsistent, that proves that it really didn't exist. But that's exact that, that he really didn't rise. But that's exactly, I would say, the opposite. I have a, a clergy friend who's now retired who used to be a newspaper reporter, work with newspapers. And I remember one time we were talking about the, the resurrection. We were talking about Easter and the resurrection. He said, you know, I, f I find those stories so believable because that's the way people are. When something shocking has happened, uh, in terms of the reports that you get, everything doesn't fit in nicely and if all of these reports there were no inconsistencies, everything was smooth was smoothed out, and every everyone agreed with ex the exact last detail, that would make me suspicious. But it's the very nature of the reports that are made. Nobody, nobody was expecting Jesus to be raised from the dead. It was shocking. They had expected. The disciples, if you remember crucifixion, it, it was a terrible means of death, but it, was, uh, it incurred incredible shame. I mean, if you were following somebody that was crucified, so, I mean, so they had no expectation. They were shocked when this happened, and they're trying to get their minds wrapped around what is actually going on, what is transpiring. And so 
the very kind of rawness, the inconsistencies of the accounts are one of the marks that make this, make this to him and to myself as well so believable. These are not people who have come together like uh, people who are in cahoots and they're trying to get their story all together, make sure they're all saying the same thing. It doesn't have that quality to it at all. And the other, one of the parts that makes it so dif uh, difficult is that we know our bodies, last time I tried to walk through a wall, the wall stopped me pretty, pretty solidly. I mean, I can't go through locked doors. I can't walk through walls. And so part of the struggle in the gospel accounts is that it was Jesus, but it's with what theologians called his glorified body. It's the resurrected body. So it was Jesus with the same body in some ways, but the body was somewhat changed. And so it was able to do things that our bodies can't do. So it was physical, and yet it was a foretaste of what our bodies will be like at the last resurrection when Jesus comes again. And so it's kind of like a down payment, or it's a foretaste. And so that's why they're, they're trying to get their minds wrapped around what has happened here. And they're, they're trying as best as they can to explain their experience because no one had ever encountered anyone who was resurrected. Lazarus was not resurrected like Jesus was. He was just revived. Jesus uh, had a, a glorified body. And so they're, they're really they're trying to put together and say, this is what happened. It's amazing. And it's like nothing we've ever seen, but it is the real Jesus. And that's why it's so important when Jesus had breakfast with people, when he, when he would break bread with people and he would eat, it was him. And he was trying to make that point over and over and over again. Now, what are the implications of the resurrection? I, I'm, I'm going to mention just what I consider a few of them that are definitely important to me. I, I think it's interesting that the resurrected Jesus still had the wounds he had the wounds in his hands and in the side. Now, you might think if he was resurrected, why would, that, why would that happen? I mean, why wouldn't those just all be healed and go away? I mean, in the glorified body, why would he still have marks uh, from the wounds? And I would submit to you, it's because he remembers his suffering. Because in the book of Hebrews and other places, the scriptures tell us he is with us in our suffering. He's not a high priest. He's not someone, he's not a God who cannot identify with our suffering. He's gone through it all. He still has the scars of the suffering that he went through and invites us and calls us to cling to him, and he promises to be with us in our suffering. He, has, he knows what it's like. He's suffered more than any of us here. And yet, he, has, he still carries those wounds, which I find very hopeful, so that when I'm suffering, I know the one to whom I pray and call has suffered, and he promises to be with me in the suffering and will never, never abandon me. The resurrection also, and I mentioned this last week, it's the vindication of the crucifixion. crucifixion. Sometimes people think, the resurrection is the cancellation of the crucifixion. No. The way of the cross that Jesus told us to follow, the way of self-sacrificial love, which is the way of the cross, has been vindicated by the resurrection. If the resurrection hadn't occurred, we could say, well, he was a nice guy, he had some interesting thoughts, but in the end, he was wrong. And that's not the way to go. But it's the resurrection that, that vindicates Jesus' life, his birth, his life, his death. And it vindicates his teaching. And it vindicates the way that he lives and says, yes, indeed, this is the one whom I sent. This is the way you are supposed to live. This is the meaning of the cross. And, and furthermore, the, the resurrection really was the vehicle that allowed the disciples to understand and plumb the meanings of the cross and, and the suffering that Jesus 
uh, suffered in our place. So it was a very resurrection that allowed them to be able to do that. The resurrection is the sign that God has defeated death. Now, in the last few weeks, I've done five funerals. Two of them, pretty big funerals. One of them, a young man, 29, died in a skiing accident. Now, we, the reason I go into those funerals, hopefully, is because of the resurrection of Jesus. Because he has said, as I have been resurrected, that's what's in store for you and me. Now, let me take a moment here to make a differentiation between Jesus did not teach mortality of the soul. I think many Christians, I used to have this quite confused. Jesus does not teach the immortality of the soul. He teaches the resurrection of the body. The Greek Plato was one of the many, many philosophers who believed the immortality of the soul. We have a physical part. We have the spiritual part. When our physical part dies, it just kind of decays, and our spirits go up into the sky somewhere, and that's where we are. That, this might be very shocking for us, that is not what Jesus teaches, okay? That's called immortality of the soul. Uh, frequently, of an understanding, the physical and the body is not seen as very important. And there's all kinds of variations of this that have impacted Christianity. Our hope is in the resurrection of the dead, that when we die... Our souls or spirits may temporarily be with God, but if in the end, when Jesus makes all things right, our bodies are going to be, rec uh, are going to be re resurrected, and we're going to have a glorified body like Jesus, and we're going to be at work ruling with Jesus. It's like, and what that does, do you understand, when we think of the resurrection of the dead, that puts a very big premium on the physical body. See, if there's one a group of people, if there's one religion should, that should have a very important understanding of the physicality, the physical world, the importance of the body and how we treat it, it should be Christians because our bodies are going to be resurrected. How we treat our bodies right now is important. It has implications for how we, how we are in the future. So Christianity, far from being kind of uh, pie in the sky sometime, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of Greek philosophy has crept into, into Christianity over time. We think of more of immortality of the souls than we do the resurrection of the body, but it's the resurrection of the body. That's our hope, and Jesus has done it. That's why sometimes it's the resurrection is referred to as transhistorical. In a way, God has promised to be in the future has happened in the present time in Jesus' resurrection. He said, this is what is in store for you as you follow me. Do you love me? It's the resurrection of the body. And so the physical world, we, it, it really puts a stamp of approval or of importance in the physical world in which we live. And you can go to Romans 17 to talk about how the whole creation is groaning under the sinfulness of human beings. So, I mean, it has implications for the creation and how we treat our creation as well. And so it's the hope of the resurrection. That's what really empowers me and motivates me when I'm at funerals. And that's my hope, the hope of the resurrection. And the, and the, the resurrection uh, is about um, God's faithfulness to us, his faithfulness, his answering promises. He's, he's actually inaugurated the kingdom of God. Jesus' um, resurrection is like the beginning of God's kingdom that's been instantiated in earth. It's not come in its fullness, and yet we are to be living resurrection lives, people that are between Easter and the coming of uh, the second coming of Christ, but we're to be living God's kingdom, as radical as that sounds. And sometimes it's confusing as that is, because when we see the way the world operates, it doesn't make sense. 
But if we follow Jesus, who is walked the way of the cross, was crucified and resurrected, we know, we believe by faith that he has instituted that the, the kingdom of God has been inaugurated and we are to follow him. There's a great quotation um, by N.T. Wright that I love when, when I think about this. He says this, The point of the resurrection is that the present bodily life is not valueless just because it will die. What you do with your body in the present matters because God has a great future in store for it. What you do in the present by painting, preaching, singing, sewing, praying, teaching, building, building hospitals, digging wells, campaigning for justice, writing poems, caring for the needy, loving your neighbor as yourself, will last into God's future. These activities are not simply ways of making the present life a little less beastly, a little more bearable, until the day when we leave it behind altogether. They are part of what we may call building God's kingdom. I want to close just with a poem I'd come across a number of years ago but had forgotten about. And actually, I uh, was reminded about it because Kathy Chung had this on her blog. If you read Ch Kathy uh, Chung's blog. It's called The Seven Stanzas at Easter by John Updike. Make no mistake, if he rose at all, it was as his body. If the cell's dissolution did not reverse, the molecule re-knit, the amino acids rekindle, the church will fall. It was not as the flowers, each soft spring recurrent. It was not as his spirit in the mouths of fuddled eyes of the eleven apostles. It was as his flesh, ours. The same hinged thumbs and toes, the same valved heart that pierced, died, withered, pause, and then regathered out of enduring might, new strength to enclose. Let us not mock God with metaphor, analogy, sidestepping transcendence, making of the event a parable, a sign painted in the faded credulity of earlier ages. Let us walk through the door. The stone is rolled back, not paper mache, not a stone in a story, but the vast rock of materiality that in the, in the slow grinding of time will eclipse for each of us the wide light of day. And if we have an angel at the tomb, make it a real angel, weighty with Max Planck's quanta, vivid with hair, opaque, in the dawn light robed in real linen, spun on a definite loom. Let us not seek to make it less monstrous. For our own convenience, for our own sense of beauty, lest awakened in one unthinkable hour, we are embarrassed by the miracle and crushed by remonstrance. Amen.